Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. What a wonderful crowd this is. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this superb institution, which is, I saw you started to do it, the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful, absolutely. And it is hard to think of a figure who better embodies that nonpartisan tradition of the National Constitution Center than our former chair, uh, President George H.W. Bush. Uh, President Bush was succeeded by President Bill Clinton as chair of the National Constitution Center. They both received the Liberty Medal together, and together their patriotic commitment to the Constitution and the Constitution Center is embodied in the George H.W. Bush Gallery downstairs, where you can visit, and I hope many of you have, and you can see rare copies of the Declaration of Independence, the first public printing of the Constitution, and one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. And President Bush uh, persuaded his son, Governor Jeb Bush, to serve as our most recent chair, uh, telling Governor Bush that serving as head of the Constitution Center was President Bush's most meaningful post-presidential service. So we are great fans and admirers of the president, and also great fans and admirers of the astonishing author and moderator that you are about to have the privilege of hearing from tonight. Um, uh, the moderator, uh, my old friend Ryan Lizza, uh, has generously agreed to come to Philadelphia to interview our author. Uh, Ryan is the leading uh, political correspondent of his time, the Washington correspondent for The New Yorker, an on-air contributor for CNN. I got to know him uh, during our years toiling in the trenches at the old New Republic uh, together, and he has uh, won many awards, including the 2012 National Press Club Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondents. And our author tonight must be the most distinguished narrative uh, historian, both of the founding and contemporary era. His books include the New York Times bestsellers, Franklin and Winston, American Gospel, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power. He won the Pulitzer Prize for American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House, and now he has turned his formidable talents to Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ryan, Lizza, and John Meacham. Have fun. Have a good time, absolutely. All right, so here we go. It's all downhill from here, that was great. <laughs> welcome to my funeral. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thanks to the National Constitution Center. Very excited for this conversation. Um, as, a, as a reporter, of, a, a journalist a few years younger than John Meacham, I, someone who I have looked up to and admired for many years, um, as, as he will tell you, at the, any times I'm looking into Bush world, he's the first call I make. <laughs> it is a very, I'm like the Marlon so, Perkins now, <laughs> of Bush world. Jim, so, move away from that cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a privilege to, uh, to, to moderate this conversation. Um, let's start with why. You spent 17 years of your life on this. It's about your lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish. Um, when, tell us, when on a one-term president, when did you, what was the moment that you decided you were okay with living, if you're writing a biography, sure. you're living with this person. Sure. When, tell us when you decided sure. to do it. Uh, it was 17 years ago, our friend Michael Beschloss uh, and I went up to Kennebunkport for a, um, an interview about A World Transformed, the book that President Bush had done with Brent Scowcroft about foreign policy. And I, going into this visit, I had the vision of George H.W. Bush that most voters had of him uh, in 1992, which was that he had, was out of time, out of touch. Um, I had a lot of Dana Carvey in my head. <laughs> um, and was struck by his quiet, persistent charisma. And it became clear to me very quickly that, oh, this is how he became president. He became president by winning over person after person after person. He couldn't give a fabulous speech to save his life. Uh, he um, 
obviously lacked the glamour and stage presence of, uh, of a Kennedy or a Reagan, but he was um, a figure who struck me as trustworthy. Hmm. And it, it was an observation, and as the years went by, seven, eight years went by, and I covered him a bit when I was at Newsweek, um, I began to understand be, be, why he had become president, because one of the fundamental political transactions, right, is do you feel comfortable in trusting your fate to another person's hands? That's, that's the, the fundamental currency of politics, uh, of electoral politics. And I began to see why people would have done that with him. And when you look at him biographically, you see that from a very early age, people had that reaction to him. Uh, his childhood nickname was Have Half because whenever he had a treat or a dessert, he would cut it in half and give the other half to whomever he was with. Huh. Um, and so there was a fundamental decency to him. Um, and I was also fascinated by the drama of the man who seemed so gracious, seemed so patrician, and yet opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act in 1964. Uh, ran the, the campaign against Michael Dukakis that was hardly a, a day at the beach. Um, who was willing to say, read my lips, no new taxes, when he didn't really, at his core, believe he would be able to keep that pledge. So the, the, the central drama of any political biography is between the better angels of one's nature and the necessity to win. Hmm. And in George Herbert Walker Bush, I think you see those two forces in, in the sharpest of, of relief. You talk about that central transaction of a politician and a voter. And in a sense, the transaction was reversed with biographer and subject. He was trusting you with his fate. How did you convince him to turn over his, yeah. this amazing repository of presidential yeah. history? Yeah. His, and please tell us a little bit about sure. the, the tapes sure. and um, how you convinced him to do that. Sure. Well, I wanted to, I knew there was a White House diary, but I wasn't sure how extensive it was. And around 2006, I guess, I went to them and said, um, I wanted to know the extent of the diary. And I had the idea of annotating and editing the diaries for publication, rather like the Johnson tapes, something like that. And he allowed me to read it. I had to read it in Houston in a conference room behind his retirement office that, um, as you all know, uh, former presidents get lots of gifts. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, foreign governments tend to send uh, George H.W. Bush are shotguns. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was a little uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> So I was in this conference room, which was really like being in an armory or you know, in an episode of Bonanza or something, um, reading a transcript of the presidential diary. And it became very clear to me before I got out of January 1989 that this was an extraordinary historical document because he had dictated it. I, what I had the transcript at that point and ultimately was given the audio. but. As you all know, and I don't know if there are any diary keepers here, but when you write a diary, even if you only intend for it to be for yourself, you are still stylizing something. You are, it is an act of performance. Mm -hmm. Dictating, particularly in the midst of a hectic, busy life, tends to be more honest. And, and it was classic Bush. I mean, the, the pronouns didn't often make much sense. Uh, sometimes they didn't make an appearance. <laughs> um, uh, you did sometimes hear that voice, uh, you know, his, his wonderful capacity for malapropisms. Uh, I didn't want to stick it in Gorbachev's ear, which, you know, uh, I think he meant I. Um, at one point he worried that I would find an empty deck of cards, which he meant empty suit or not a full deck of cards, but <laughs> in Bushland it all became one. Um, <laughs> Our friend Jacob Weisberg actually published a whole book of Bushisms, which I recommend. Uh, I think he once told me he sends his, his kids to college with those books. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> very so successful. Pl plenty of that. <laughs> uh, so I read the diary, and I remember then we went, uh, it took me a couple of days, um, and then I sat down and said, what I would like to do is write a full life. Um, it, 
I'd like to talk to you extensively for it, if it will help, uh, because his son was still president of the United States, so there were complications, obviously, um, I'll publish it posthumously. Or, as he put it, you mean after I'm Paul's up? <laughs> uh, I said, yes, yes, Mr. President, that, that, that's what I mean. Men's grill in the sky, you know. Um, and, and then afterward, I could publish the diary as a, as a historical document. Um, and he said yes. Uh, I don't know how much debate there was about it internally. Uh, he seemed comfortable. Uh, I think that now I was coming from, I, at that time I was the managing editor of Newsweek and the Republic of Newsweek and the Republic of Bush did not always have the smoothest of diplomatic relations. Um, I remember a certain cover story. <laughs> October 1987, uh, the Newsweek did a cover called Fighting the Wimp Factor. Um, which if President Bush, your former chairman, uh, were here right now, he could tell you blow by blow exactly how it happened. Um, and it enraged him and endures painfully in the family imagination. So I do know that when it was, he sent a note around to his siblings, his children, and a couple of aides saying that he had decided to give me these diaries and cooperate on the book, um, there was a sense that it was, I think it was rather like when he sent the note around about jumping out of an airplane. It was, you know, have you lost every last bit of your mind at this point um, because of the Newsweek connection? But, you know, George H.W. Bush is nothing if not rather Machiavellian. So what better way to inoculate yourself uh, against the charge that you've handpicked someone mm than to have an editor of a magazine with whom you have publicly feuded for decades do a biography. I mean, I, I, I'm not naive enough to think that, I, not to think that that was at some level a factor. Um, then, as the, so we, we, we sat and we talked um, in Maine, in Houston. Uh, I actually once had lunch in Philadelphia with uh, Gorbachev and Bush 41. Um, that was, arguably the most surrealistic moment of my life. Um, I'm a boy from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I was, you know, here we were. Um, and I remember how Gorbachev filled the room. Um, and, but there was this overt and, and palpable respect Gorbachev had for Bush, um, a deference to him uh, for what he had done to help him along the way. Um, so that happened here. Um, and the, no, the note went around in 09. Uh, we talked for about nine years. Uh, when I, I, I did a biography of Jefferson uh, four years ago and needed to decide on my next project, so I went to him and said, our deal was pause up, uh, but you're not. <laughs> um, and, uh, How did he take that? Despite your best efforts by jumping out of these goddamn airplanes. Uh, uh, and. So he said, that's fine, let the chips fall where they may. He's very comfortable with what he thinks historians will make of his record. Um, because he thinks it's solid. And he, he thinks it's solid, it. he did his best. He tried, yeah. it's like his mother said, try your best, do your best. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is worth noting is because of what we do for a living, we're fortunate enough to spend time around presidents and presidential families. No presidential family would do what the Bushes did here. The, he gave me his vice presidential, presidential diaries, gave me the audio with no conditions whatever. Hmm. I didn't have to ask him if I could quote something. I didn't have to show him anything, nothing. Mrs. Bush gave me her diary, which stretches back to 1948. And the only condition on the whole project was that I had to ask her to clear quotations, not context, not my conclusion from what I made of those quotations with her. I took her 90 pages of proposed quotations and she took nothing off the record. Hmm. So they're just, a, they're just it's, it's a remarkable appreciation for history, for the kind of, it doesn't surprise me at all that he found this position at the, at the Constitution Center to be meaningful. Uh, he, and I think it's why he said a lot of the things he said to me. He wanted them on the record. 
So let's let's start with the Bushes and the Walkers, these two yeah. fascinating families yeah. uh, that actually made their fortune in the Midwest. I was reminded when I read it. I always think of you always think of them as the New England Wasp <coughs> family, and yet it's Missouri and it's, Ohio. It's St. Louis so, and Columbus. So yeah. let let's start there and tell us sure. what how um, what they passed on to George H. W. Bush. Well, he came from a family of means, uh, obviously. Uh, but they were a class, two classic Gilded Age clans, basically. Uh, his uh, great-great-grandfather, no, sorry, his great-grandfather was an Episcopal priest who lost his faith, uh, ended up becoming a Unitarian, moving to Concord, infused with the spirits of Thoreau and Emerson. Uh, his son reacted against him by becoming an engineer, went to the Stevens Institute of Technology. There is a theme. Here, uh, the Bushes we know about are Bushes not who s followed a well-marked groove in the family lives, but who broke away. And so Samuel P. Bush, who was his grand, who uh, George Herbert Walker Bush's grandfather, broke away from his father's theology, world of twilight, um, world of philosophy, to become an eminently practical Gilded Age chairman of Buckeye Steel, uh, Buckeye Steel Castings. Once, um, one of my, the most fun afternoons I had do doing this was doing a joint conversation interview with President Bush and Nancy Bush Ellis, his sister. Think Catherine Hepburn in your <laughs> close. And they were both, they were both, at that point, they were both in their mid 80s. And um, they, were, <laughs> they were trying to remember Grandfather Bush, the name of Grandfather Bush's company. And uh, they were sort of talking to each other about it, sitting in the living room at Kennebunkport. And um, President Bush said, Buckeye Steel. And Mrs. Ellis said, Pops, how wonderful. You're one up for Buckeye Steel. Um, everything <laughs> is a contest in the Bush family. Uh, you're one up. Um, so he broke away. Uh, from the world of theology and, and, and philosophy and made a considerable fortune in the Midwest. Uh, his son then went from Columbus East to New England, uh, basically becoming essentially a private equity guy, uh, Prescott Bush. Uh, he moved to Greenwich, uh, worked for Brown Brothers Harriman, the formidable private bank. Um, so the New England line really starts only with George Bush's father. Uh, the Walkers are a little wilder. Um, G. H. Walker, uh, George H. W. Bush's um, maternal grandfather, was a handful. Uh, as one of his relatives described him, he was a real son of a bitch. Um, he uh, once shot at a wasp, uh, which was flying around. Not the not the kind of wasp the they were. Um, <laughs> you have to explain that when you talk about the Bushes. They shot a wasp. Um, <laughs> It was the fly, not, not a cousin, um, in, 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 his, in his dining room. Uh, and and we're, a, we're a big Midwestern investment house uh, there. And Averill Harriman hired G.H. Walker to come to New York and run the Harriman money. So he, they moved to Madison Avenue in 1920. Uh, the year before Prescott Bush and uh, President Bush's mother, uh, Dorothy, married. Dorothy Bush is hugely important in this story. She once, uh, George Bush's mother, she once broke her wrist in the middle of a tennis match but continued and won. Um, her brother, uh, George Bush's brother, Jonathan, once said, mother was always gracious in defeat, but of course she never lost at anything. Uh, so there was that. Uh, there's. What was very important to both families and these two tributaries that came in to form the river uh, of, of George H.W. Bush is the competition was the air they breathed. They were Victorian uh, rugby school kind of muscular Christianity athletes. They saw athletic vigor as a sign of moral strength and a test of moral character. Fair play. Uh, scrupulous manners, but you needed to win. You needed to win. There's a little line, Ryan knows this, one of the great joys of doing history is finding 
some forgotten paragraph in a forgotten oral history. And there was a, a piece that President Bush had written about his mother uh, for a magazine in the 80s, I think when he was vice president. And he remembered that the trees in the yard at Grove Lane in Greenwich, where they grew up, tall, tall trees, that their mother expected them, the children, to go out and climb to the very top of those trees, no matter how high, no matter how hard. And what was so interesting about this, here's the Vice President of the United States remembering this, is it was just expected that you were to do it. And a neighboring a neighbor came by once and said, you know, Mrs. Bush, that's awfully dangerous. And Mrs. Bush said, well, if they fall, they have to learn. Thank you. And <laughs> sent them along. Um, that was their world. They used to, th the Walker family, Dorothy Walker learned how to swim by being thrown in the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> at Walker's Point, and it was sink or swim. And that culture continued and was the ambient universe that George Herbert Walker Bush, called Poppy, uh, grew up in, in Greenwich and Kennebunkport. Uh, they shot quail and dove down in South Carolina. It was what Nancy Ellis, the sister again, described it as a vanished universe, a grand, unimaginable world now. Uh, so very privileged, but also drilled into them. That they had to serve, they had to give back. To whom much is given, much is expected. You, one of the things that really comes through in the book that did not come through in his, any of his parts of his public life is how emotional ah. this person is. And I don't know if it's just age and the, time, the period you spent with him, but tell us about that. And then, of course, his youth was formed by two pretty serious tragedies, the loss of his daughter and what happened in World War II. Tell us how those two events He was, it's, it, yes, that was the big surprise to me was how emotional he is. Uh, as Christopher Buckley, his former speechwriter says, he has the tear ducts of a Sicilian grandmother. <laughs> uh, uh, he cries, you know, there'll be a heavy dew and he'll cry. Um, uh, and, I, and we had a number of moments where he would cry and then I would cry. <laughs> it was like the world's wor worst wasp-on-wasp -wasp therapy. I mean, it wasn't very effective for either one of us, but, but, but fascinating. Um, he, uh, the two events Ryan alludes to, which I do believe formed the foundation of his drive and help explain why he became and how he became president, uh, the first was during World War II, he'd gone to Andover uh, on December 7th, 1941, about 2.30 in the afternoon when the news came of Pearl Harbor. He immediately wanted to enlist. He wanted to go, he told me, into the Royal Canadian Air Force, where you could get into the battle faster, obviously, because Great Britain was involved with, with Nazi uh, at war. Um, he was convinced to at least wait till May or June. On June 12th, 1924, he, uh, 1942, he turned 18. He uh, graduated from Andover and he drove to Boston and took an oath as a naval enlistee uh, in the United States Navy, all on the same day. Uh, on the 2nd of September, 1944, in an operation codenamed Baker, he was supposed to take out a communication supply point uh, for a Japanese supply point on Chichijima, an island in the, the Bonin Islands, and was shot down. Uh, he did every, he had two crewmen, he did everything he could to get them to hit the silk, as he put it, to bail out. He bailed out and nearly, was nearly decapitated because he went out as the plane kept going. And so the, the gash on his head came from the tail of the plane. Um, he lands deep in the, deep in the water, Fortunately, the life raft, is, as, which has fallen off his, his vest, is nearby. He spends four hours out there uh, before a submarine on what was called lifeguard duty arrived to pick him up. Um, I asked him in his 80s uh, whether he thought about those two, how often he thought about those two men, Del Delaney and Ted White, and he said every day. Hmm. And he had two questions about that he asked himself all the time, which is, did I do enough to save them? And why was I spared? Hmm. And I think that my, part of my biographical case is that I believe he spent much of the ensuing decades 
trying to prove that he was commensurate with having been spared on that day, that he was worthy of their sacrifice. And I believe that that was exacerbated and deepened when in 1953, the Bushes lost a daughter, Robin, to leukemia. Uh, the Bushes had never heard the word before the diagnosis. Uh, she lived for about six months after the diagnosis. Uh, in talking about Robin, the president never failed to weep, at one point crying so hard that his chief of staff actually came into the room to find out what I was doing to her boss, <laughs> uh, basically. But I believe, and so I asked him then, you know, what, what did you learn from, what, what, what can you do in a situation like this? What do you take, how do you make sense of it? And he said that he, what it ultimately did was it proved to him that life was unpredictable and fragile. And so again, I, th I think the two experiences, the loss of his men in, in, in the war, the loss of Robin, came together to create this code of always looking forward, always moving, always trying to achieve. Um, because you don't know which day is gonna be your last, and you need to make sure that it's clear that you were worth being spared when others were not. Hmm. We were talking uh, earlier before we came out here about roads not taken. Right. And a series of events in his life that if he had done X instead of Y, right. you know, none of this would have happened. Right. Um, and you had a, a great list of them. They're great counterfactuals. Yeah. You know, I, I love counterfactuals. Um, my favorite one, which is from Arthur Schlesinger, uh, was what if um, in 1932, when Winston Churchill, after a little bit too much Johnny Walker read, which is to say <laughs> he was awake, uh, <laughs> stepped out on Fifth Avenue and looked left instead of right because he thought he was in London and got hit by a car and was almost killed. Um, and that's in December 1932 when the assassin attempted to kill Franklin Roosevelt in Miami and instead killed the mayor of Chicago. Uh, what, what would have happened in 1940, 41, 42, if Roosevelt and Churchill had both, had both died? Um, so th these questions fascinate me. Um, I think a critical moment for him was in 1948 when he graduated from Yale after two and a half years uh, and just turns down a job offer at Brown Brothers Harriman and at G.H. Walker and Company, decides not to go to Wall Street he was turned down, by the way. There's a letter in the library. He did not get it. He failed an entry test to get a job, an entry level job with Procter and Gamble. <laughs> now, you wonder how those were pretty tough standards. <laughs> uh, what were they looking for exactly? Um, I, when I reminded, he'd forgotten that. He said, "That's right. I didn't get that job." Well, well that, was, uh, that, that was that's bad. <laughs> um, so uh, he gets, in, instead he gets in a red Studebaker, his parents had given him, and they drive to Odessa, he drives to Odessa, Texas. Uh, Odessa was seen as so foreign uh, that uh, Mrs. Pierce, Barbara's mother, would send them boxes of soap <laughs> because she didn't think they had soap in Texas. <laughs> now I'm from Tennessee and I pro we don't have as much, I'll admit, <laughs> but we have some. Uh, <laughs> His first meal in Texas, he stopped in Abilene and ordered chicken fried steak, and he didn't know whether it was chicken fried like a steak or steak fried like a chicken. <laughs> so he ordered a several Lone Star beers so that it didn't matter. Um, but he w went into the oil business, uh, had plenty of support, uh, raised a lot of money through his uncle, Herbie Walker. Um, you know, he was, I'm, I'm not arguing that he was a totally self made guy by any means. But he had a comfortable path laid out. And everyone in this room, I think, can imagine the life he would have led if he'd gone to Wall Street. He would have lived in Greenwich, maybe Larchmont. He would have gone back and forth. He would have read The New Yorker. He would have had one or two too many martinis here and there. He would have played golf on Saturday and maybe skipped church to play it on Sunday. He would have raised money for local congressional Connecticut candidates. And he would have been a New England Republican. 
And we all know how well that's turned out. <laughs> um, so going to Texas in 1948 both gave him the means to make his own fortune. And it's a little like the Google seed round of funding if you're a Republican, right? To go to Texas in 1948 is the very beginning of the nation's shift, the political center of gravity of the country, going to, to South and West. So going to Texas, I, I do not believe he would have been president of the United States if he had not moved to Texas. Um, when he did move to Texas, George Brown of Brown and Root, a great supporter of Lyndon Johnson's, tried to get him to become a Democrat. Hmm. Because as you all know, it was one party rule then. So there were conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats, and those were the two parties. <laughs> and so Brown came to him and said, if you want to join the the John Conley Democrats, you can be governor, you can be senator, the sky's the limit. And he said no. And if he had become a Democrat, if, if, if he had just been so ambitious for office that he would have taken that shorter path, instead he remained a Republican in a very Democratic state, losing two statewide races to, uh, to Democrats at a point when the, the state wasn't quite ready to go. Um, I think that was a, a critical one. Um, I guess my favorite, uh, well, I have two last favorites. Uh, one is he was, after he lost the 1970 Senate race to Lloyd Benson, uh, and you really couldn't tell the two men apart. The Dallas Morning News did a wonderful story about, all right, so we have two tall, handsome war heroes who served in the House, uh, and Benson ran actually to Bush's right in that campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. interestingly, but Bush wanted to go to the United Nations to be ambassador. Nixon wanted him to come work for Bob Haldeman. What second prize? <laughs> uh, so they have a meeting in the Oval Office. Nixon says, I want you to, you know, I, I need someone, I need you here. Um, and Bush, of course, says, well, I'd like to go to the UN. I'd like to go make a case for your, for you and your foreign policy in New York, in the media circles, in the financial circles. And it shows a tactical brilliance on Bush's part because here's this polished son of the senator from Connecticut, the Ivy Leaguer, saying that he's gonna go make the case for the grocer son from Yorba Linda. It shows that Bush understood Nixon pretty well. But he, so they say, well, we'll think about that, but right now I want you to be an assistant to the president. And so they send him down the hall with Haldeman to get him a White House office. Now, as you can tell, I admire George Herbert Walker Bush immensely, but God knows what he would have said on those tapes. <laughs> uh, because he's indiscreet? Well, no, you know? just, but just what, what we say every day. I mean, can you imagine? Right. I, mean, right. I mean, Richard Nixon turned Billy Graham into an anti-Semite for an afternoon. I mean, he did it all. So, you know, to have, been in, to have been working for Haldeman at the beginning of Watergate, let's just put it this way. I don't think that was a, a quick path forward politically, <laughs> particularly since Haldeman went to prison. Uh, so there, that, that, that's, that's a road. And then Nixon called him back in. He'd been thinking about the argument and sent him to the United Nations. And then one, which is, I guess, the most familiar, is if uh, Henry Kissinger and Alan Greenspan had been able to successfully negotiate that President Ford would become Ronald Reagan's running mate as vice president, at the 1980 convention in Detroit in July, uh, Bush would never have been president and neither would his son. Uh, I asked both of them, I thought if, I said, if that deal had worked out, if Reagan and Ford had run together in 1980 as, as they were trying to do, would you have made it, made it? And 41 said no and 43 said no, I wouldn't have either. So you can argue that our modern political history really took shape on that Wednesday evening in Detroit. Reagan didn't call Bush until 11.35 p.m. on the Wednesday night of the convention to offer him the job. And it, the, the Ford talks went on that long. And it was Barbara Bush who set in motion the actually, what became a very, a pretty warm relationship, at least between President Reagan and the Bushes by walking up to Reagan the next day when they were having coffee and saying, don't worry, Governor, we're gonna work our tails off for you. 
And Mike Deaver later said that was the smartest thing anyone could have said to Ronald Reagan right then. So take us through the period from 64 to 80, where the, one of the central di political dynamics of his life really takes shape, yeah. and that is his relationship with the right and conservatives yeah. in the Republican Party. I mean, he runs us for Senate in 64, the year of Goldwater, and he's a Goldwater he's guy. He's a Goldwater guy. And yet, by 80, after he's battled with Ronald Reagan, the quote, I think, is, I spent 16 years fighting the man and what he stood for. And of course, this is all, you know, uh, is a harbinger of his own presidency right. when the tax deal put, uh, turns off the right and arguably exactly. leads to his loss. But tell us about those years and the, the changes in the Republican Party and how he navigated that. It, it's exactly right. There, there were basically two wings, right? There, was the, there were moderate conservative, well, there were three wings to begin with, uh, three, three elements of the Republican Party in 64. You had the liberal Rockefeller wing, of which his father, Prescott Bush, Prescott Bush was not a moderate Republican. He was a liberal Republican. He once tried to help get Nixon thrown off the ticket in 1956 uh, in huh. favor of Christian Herder. Now, I think this is the first time Christian Herder's name has been spoken in the last 35 <laughs> years. Um, and I think that you all should be proud and happy that you were here when it happened. Christian uh, Herder would do good, which pretty well in the Iowa caucuses, I'm guessing. He, oh, yeah. Can't you imagine? He was a man of the people. Uh, you know, he made John Foster Dulles look exciting. Um, so there's another one, John Foster Dulles. This is pretty, this is pretty glamorous. Um, so you had the Rockefeller liberal wing. You had the moderate conservatives really embodied by Gerald Ford uh, and George H.W. Bush. And then you had the burgeoning movement conservatives, Goldwater and a man who on October 28th, 1964, gave a primetime address in favor of Goldwater's candidacy, called a time for choosing Ronald Reagan. So Bush runs for the Senate in 64 as a Goldwater conservative. If he, he was an ambitious Republican in Texas. He wanted to win. He embraced Goldwater. He regretted it afterward. He opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. We should just go ahead and say that. Part of my argument about Bush is that while he would say and do things of which he was not proud to seek power, what he, when he amassed that power, he ultimately did the right thing for the country. And I'll give you some examples in a second to make this case. To my mind, if you believe that you are destined to be president, if you're destined to do great things, to serve your nation on the largest of stages, then those kinds of compromises are not cynical, but instrumental. And that's a fundamental political reality. So in 64, uh, he's uh, against Red China getting into the UN. Uh, he's against the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and by February of 65, after he loses to Ralph Yarborough, he's writing letters about how the party has to be moderate, that it can't be so far right. He immediately regretted it, and then ran in a congressional district in Houston, uh, a new one that had been drawn. He won, he got a primary opponent out of the race by telling him that he not only wanted to use this House seat as a stepping stone possibly to the Senate, but to the presidency. So as early as 1965, Bush was saying that he wanted a shot at the White House. When I told George W. Bush that, he nearly fell off his chair. Hmm. Um, yeah, that was in Mrs. Bush's diary. Um, you know, Nixon, of course, is the nominee in 68. Uh, he tries to bridge all of these, uh, uh, these three elements, does it well. Uh, Bush, though, is seen as a, um, at best, a moderate conservative by the movement conservatives. They did not see him as one of their own. Uh, he had a uh, pretty liberal record in the House. Uh, Wilbur Mills, the Ways and Means chairman, got so tired of his legislation on family planning that he started calling him rubbers. Um, uh, and this is an, this is an important point. Um, George H.W. Bush's reality, his education as a politician, was in the House of Representatives. 
from 1967 to 1971. Two years under a Democrat, Lyndon Johnson, two years under a Republican, Richard Nixon. Congressman George Bush voted with Lyndon Johnson 53% of the time. Mm. So you would think, okay, so when Richard Nixon, the Republican, becomes president, that number is going to skyrocket. It did skyrocket to 55% <laughs> of the time. Can you imagine right now a member of either the Democratic or the Republican House caucus voting with a president of the opposite party 53% of the time? It is virtually impossible. That was the political world out of which George Bush came. And it helps explain his own presidency and his own sense that he should, he should be able to reach out to his friends, Lud Ashley, Democrat of Ohio, Sonny Montgomery, Democrat of Mississippi, Dan Roskentowski, of Democrat of Chicago. These were all the guys he went to the house gym with. He played handball with them, paddle ball. And he just, that to him, that was Washington. And the movement conservatives distrusted that. They distrusted bipartisanship in many ways. And uh, when he ran in 1980 uh, against Ronald Reagan, he w was the moderate alternative. Uh, he won the primary in this state. Uh, he won Michigan. He won Iowa famously. Uh, but Reagan didn't want him in 1980. He, he had said in Pennsylvania, he had used the phrase voodoo economics. Turned out he was right. Uh, uh, it sort of embarrassed him later. Uh, he was does he still does he still believe that he was right on, on that? Does he still think in terms of if you do, do, do engage him? Well, no, they all they have, they've all talked themselves into well, if only Congress had cut spending. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it's always if only. Um, but I I think that. There were positions he changed between 1980 and 1988 that were politically expedient, but they were heartfelt as well. Uh, his position on um, choice was a heartfelt shift. Um, his position on um, uh, school prayer, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, things like that, he, he felt in his heart, uh, but it was also a product of the shifting political times. And then you get to his presidency, and he has a right wing that bolts on him. Well, this relationship you, you spelled out, that his, his view of campaigning versus governing, um, it, it sort of really trips him up as president, doesn't it? Because yeah. There's this great scene in yeah. the book where you're talking to Dukakis, and Dukakis tells you that. Uh, we say, well, obviously, the first year I'm not going to be able to raise taxes. This, and, is, this <laughs> is so great. I'm sorry. I, I just, Tell I, the story. I, no, I, I, Michael Dukakis, Governor Dukakis, was very generous with his time on this. And can you imagine having to talk about to someone like me about this? Um, if you're Dukakis, um, it always reminds, it reminds me of the story um, when Bob Dole lost to Bill Clinton in '96. He called um, George McGovern and said, "When does it stop hurting?" And, and McGovern said, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so having to talk to Bush's biographer, I'm sure it was really high on Governor Dukakis's list of fun things to do. <laughs> but uh, the, the, during the courtesy call after the election, they're standing there, and Bush says, well, you know, I certainly can't raise taxes in the first year. And Dukakis <laughs> is like, this guy just kicked my ass all over the country saying he was never going to raise taxes. You know, uh, so um, the other telling story there came from Vin Weber, uh, the congressman from Minnesota, uh, who, when Gingrich, here's a quick wing of a butterfly just for fun. Um, John Tower is nominated to be Secretary of Defense, remember, in 1989. He, fa he fails because of charges of drinking and womanizing, which used to just be part of being a senator. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure not anymore, and Brian could tell us all about that. Uh, certainly not but with the New Yorker covering you. Um, but uh, so Tower is defeated. Bush reaches out to Dick Cheney to become the Secretary of Defense. Dick Cheney was the majority, was the GOP minority whip. Cheney comes out of the House leadership, leaving a spot for Newt Gingrich. 
to rise to a leadership position. Without Gingrich in the leadership, his rebelling against the, the budget deal in 1990 would not have been as significant. And it's almost impossible to imagine that Gingrich could have leapfrogged Cheney to have become Speaker of the House in 1994. So it's another one of those counterfactuals that sort of is, is fun, to, fun to think about. But in 1989, as Gingrich becomes chairman, uh, becomes whip, and uh, Bush is in his diary saying, everybody's contrasting my style against Newt's, and Newt's Mr. Confrontation, but I've been elected president and he hasn't. You know, talking kind of Gary Cooper tough into his, <laughs> into his diary. But he, as ever with George Bush, because his instinct is to reach out, have half Bush invites Gingrich and Vin Weber, who ran Gingrich's campaign in the Republican caucus, over for a beer with John Sununu in the residence. And as Vin Weber said, only George Bush would think to invite the campaign manager as well. It's a very generous thing to do. But they can tell as they're having this beer that there's something that Bush wants to say that he's not saying. And finally, Weber says, Mr. President, would you just tell us what worries you most about us? And Bush says, without hesitation, I worry that your idealism might, may someday get in the way of what I see as sound governance. Mm. And Weber said, he always appreciated that Bush said idealism, not nuttiness, <laughs> not purity, not ideology even, but your idealism. He gave them credit that this was, they believed in the anti-tax orthodoxy, et cetera, the supply side orthodoxy. So then when he decides on the 26th of June, 1990, to drop the Read My Lips pledge, uh, Gingrich finds out from a reporter, and Weber finds out, and Weber immediately, his mind says, that's what he was talking about. He was signaling that at some point, he was going to have to break this pledge for reasons of sound governance. And that led to the Republican rebellion. It let, helped fuel the 1994 um, revolution. It helped bring Pat Buchanan into the 1992 primary race. It helped bring Ross Perot into the 1992 race. And yet, if you ask Bill Clinton, he will tell you at length, <laughs> which is redundant, that the 1990 budget deal set the terms for the prosperity of the 1990s. Bush said something he didn't fully believe to get elected, but then when he was in office, he put the interests of the country ahead of his own political interests. And he knew he was putting his second term on the line. In an imitable, in his inimitable way, he said, I'm probably dead meat. But he felt he had to do it. The, his, his son's administration uh, created a boom in many, uh, mostly liberals, celebrating the father's yeah. administration, especially on foreign policy. Right. But the, the case is, 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 pretty, uh, is pretty sound that he's one of our, our greatest modern foreign policy presidents. What's, lay out the, the case for that. Very, quick, very quickly, uh, the Berlin Wall fall, well, Tiananmen Square happens first. We, we don't connect, we need to connect these two. This is one of my goals in life. Um, <laughs> I need some more goals. Uh, some, <laughs> I need some better goals. But um, one of the reasons he reacted so calmly and quietly and unemotionally, seemingly unemotionally, to the fall of the Berlin Wall was because of what had happened in Tiananmen Square four months before, where a repressive regime facing a revolution had reacted with violence. He was watching what was going on in Berlin through the prism of Tiananmen, whereas a lot of his opponents, a lot of commentators, simply saw the, Berlin, the fall of the wall in isolation. Bush didn't see it in isolation, partly because he had been in China, partly because it was his job to see the world whole. He did not want to give the hardliners uh, in the Soviet Union or in Berlin, uh, East Berlin, the opportunity to use violence to try to turn back that tide. So I think, and if you ask him, I ask him this, and it is one of these moments with a, as a biographer where you're not getting the answer you want. 
I said, what are you proudest of? And you hope for some glorious moment that's easy to dramatize. <laughs> and he said, German reunification. And I thought, oh, Jesus. You know, now, now I have to learn about German reunification. Uh, but it secured Europe. To him, German reunification truly signaled the end of both World War II and the Cold War. Um, it was a huge deal to him. He was the first person in the administration who was really focused on it, uh, interestingly. Um, so that's, that's a huge achievement. The execution of the first Gulf War, with some caveats, obviously, uh, was in a, you know, 35 nations, uh, a significant Arab cohort. He never celebrated the victory. Uh, he entered into a kind of post-war despondency. Yeah, this is fascinating. Tell us about this. He, he, um, he, to the point where he considered not running for re-election. He did. Uh, in two periods, he fantasized about not running. Uh, once, one was right after the Gulf War, when his approval ratings are at 89, 90%. He says, I, I'm just not sure I want to run again. Because he had gone from the high drama of the war, of the 5 a.m. briefings, of, the, of, of all the phone calls to foreign leaders, you know, the great, the legend, which is true, of his master, masterly performance uh, in those months. And then suddenly he had to go back and deal with Dick Gephardt. And that just didn't have a whole lot of appeal uh, to him. And so he thought about um, uh, stepping down, not resigning, but not running for reelection. This was exacerbated by a thyroid condition called Graves' disease, uh, which, for which he was treated, but it's a very tricky thing to regulate your thyroid once you have to do it. Um, the risk is if, if your medicine is a little low, you're lethargic, you're not as acute, um, your energy levels are down, if you raise the dosage up too far, your heart can go into atrial fibrillation, which happened to him twice. I, there's one episode in the book uh, in 1992, which is reported for the first time, right before the Republican convention. Um, so 91, 92, he's down in spirit because of the end of the war and the beginning of the domestic uh, strife and the, and the, the recession. He's not feeling well. He, um, and I think, I speculate, that actually the diplomacy around the Gulf War probably was the work he was put on Earth to do, when you think about it. Uh, he saw it through the prism of World War II. If you don't stop a dictator there, you pay a higher price later. The, one of the most dramatic moments in, on his audio diary is when he's coming back from Camp David on the 5th of August, 1990, three days after the invasion. And he's worried that the Saudis are not gonna stand up, that the Saudis will cut a deal with Saddam and let Saddam keep Kuwait, and that then Saddam will use Kuwait as a staging area to go into Saudi Arabia. And you can hear the blades moving on, on, on Marine One as he's flying in. And he says, if this happens, we will have the, something with the magnitude of a new world war. Hmm. The helicopter lands. That's the moment he comes down the steps and says, this will not stand, this aggression against Kuwait. So in his view, the Gulf Which War. Which was not yet vetted or through the interagency process. That was just him saying that, right? In fact, he walks into the White House and Brent Scowcroft says, this will not stand. Where did you get that? <laughs> because the administration was still divided. Very much so uh, about the how, you know, was it, how vital a national interest was it? Yeah. And what had happened over the weekend is it was not Margaret Thatcher saying don't go wobbly. That was at a later point in a different context. Um, I always have to make that point. Uh, she, there was the sense that could we project enough force? Would the Arab world rebel uh, against the presence of American forces? An immensely complicated uh, situation. Um, and one of the things that historians and biographers and journalists, I think, have to be careful of is we tend not to give credit to leaders, politicians, public figures who prevent bad things. Because it's not all that dramatic. Yeah. 
Right. Nobody ever wins on a counterfactual. No one wins, wins on re-election on a counterfactual. Or, or you know, you I prevented this the, from happening. The classic yeah. example is your local news tonight is not going to say no traffic deaths today. <laughs> right? It's just not going to say it. So, but historians I think have a, have a particular obligation at least I feel one to try to dramatize successes that are not easy, that are not easily dramatizable because we want more there were no traffic deaths today than the other. Uh, this is a qu good question from an audience member, which is why do you think that Presidents Clinton and Bush became such great friends? And I, I, I want to just um, point out that where the book opens, his disappointment on election night in November of 1992, where right. he gets up from bed and starts speaking into his recorder, and there's almost this general, you, you, in, in his comments, there is this generational passing of the baton from Bush to Clinton, where he talks about honor, duty, country, and doesn't believe that Bill Clinton represents the same values that his generation represented. Um, so the relationship seems like it starts off on pretty rocky terrain, and yeah. yet they well, develop this he, he, he amazing. Thought he, a, he thought he was a draft dodger. Yeah, <laughs> he thought he was a yeah. draft yeah. With Hey, let's go get a beer. <laughs> yeah. How did that relationship develop over time? Well, it, it's it's George W. Bush's fault, uh, <laughs> basically. Um, it, it was after the tsunami in two thousand and four. Uh, so it had okay. It was that late. Yeah. Um, now he now they, there was contact. Of, Clinton, uh, you know, Bush negotiated NAFTA, uh, didn't have time to get it ratified. It fell to Clinton in early 1993 to do that. He invited Bush and Ford and Carter, I think, um, I don't think Nixon came, to the White House to make a bipartisan effort speech on behalf of, uh, of NAFTA. And um, after Clinton gave his pitch, Bush got up and said, I just realized why he's living here and I'm not. Uh, which was a, a generous thing for him, him to say. So there was, there was some contact in what our friends Nancy Gibbs and Mike Duffy called the club, the President's Club. But the real uh, moment where, as George W. Bush says, Bill Clinton has become his brother by another mother, um, <laughs> really began on the tsunami trip. And I, I think, basically, I think that Bill Clinton is one of the most charming and interesting political talents in American history. Bush has spent his life in politics, so it's interesting. Uh, I think Clinton sees in Bush a father figure. Uh, and also, Clinton is very historically minded, and so he would see the last, gener the last president of the greatest generation, an emblem of the fading Cold War statesmanship, uh, unquestionably. It's very funny, though. 41 has said to me, you know, Clinton, he talks all the time. <laughs> and, and he says, and how do you know what he says is true? It's like, and then he sort of does a, sort of a bad Clinton voice. He'll say, you know, George, there are, some, there are 192 windmills in Nigeria. We need to, and he says, how the hell does he know there are 192? How could there be? I'm sorry, I gotta tell you one other story, which is fantastic. So, so they're going. They're going to. It's going, they're going to go to Southeast Asia and try to and raise money and, and, and help. And so George W. Bush and his father are in one part of a motorcade going to um, uh, sign the book of condolence at the Indonesian embassy in Washington. Clinton's in the another part of the motorcade. So the Bushes, always on time, always moving quickly, come in. Uh, uh, Clinton comes in with them. Uh, they, they, there's a big painting on the wall. And Clinton grabs the consul general. The ambassador is upstairs uh, with the families. And Clinton says, that is a beautiful picture. Who painted that? And the consul said, oh, that's Umbunga. This is the way Bush tells the story. <laughs> and Clinton goes, that's great. And so they, they go upstairs, they sign the book of condolence, they come back down with the ambassador who has not been there in the first place, and Clinton grabs him and says, that is my favorite umbonga I have ever seen. I have loved his work. And the Bushes are like, no wonder this guy got two turns. 
so I think they're very different. I think it's, it, it's an odd couple relationship. <laughs> Uh, I've, heard, I've, heard, uh, I've heard two of the three presidents in that story tell it. I haven't heard it from Clinton, but I bet will confirm it. <laughs> well, let, let me, let's just end with a, a little bit more of a current political uh, question. What do, you think that, um, what do you think that Jeb Bush has learned from, um, from his father? There, I think, yeah, I, Just to add one other point to this. There, one argument, if you look at the, the, the history that you covered in the Republican Party, uh, is that the successes that you outline in, in very, um, your argument for his, the successes of his presidency, I think, are spot on both domestically and foreign policy. And yet the, the Republican Party on both foreign policy and domestic policy has really moved away from where George H.W. Bush was, despite the, the Renaissance and, and, and authors like you, yourself looking at them quite favorably. What what does, what does George H.W. Bush think? Does he think that he's lost the battle on foreign policy in his party and domestic policy and that he will be, that his, his reputation will never be recovered in the, in the Republican Party? That's one question. And then what has his son taken away from that history? The great questions. Uh, on the first, I don't think he thinks about it, honestly, in those terms. Yeah. Uh, he worries. He worried that he felt like an asterisk. He worried that he was lost between Reagan and the trials and tribulations of his sons. Um, and I hope that we're helping on that a little bit uh, because I do think he, his life repays attention. Um, both because I think there are good lessons to take away and I also think there are instructive lessons, which is even the most noble seeming politicians are you know, prone to compromises and mistakes and sin and shortcoming in a way that um, that does not make them always admirable and so this this is this is a I hope a clear-eyed portrait uh, in that sense um, I think that you know somebody asked me the other day could George H.W. Bush be nominated today in the Republican Party and my answer was he damn near didn't get nominated the first time uh, <laughs> It was a close call. Yeah. Uh, so, and I do think in this case, and this is pure punditry, so take it for what it's worth. I do think that Jeb has a lot, uh, Governor Bush has a lot in common with his father um, in that, and that he's a slightly more serious. Uh, he does not have his brother or his mother's wit. Um, and so he needs to, I think there's some lessons from his father's successful negotiation of these waters. Um, first of all, when Bushes go negative, they don't do it well in person. We saw that with the Rubio thing. They, they do it well with commercials, they do it well through surrogates, but you need to contract that out. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a key lesson. Uh, hire well for that. Um, the other is they both George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush and you can argue whether this is good or bad, but politic, in raw political terms, it's effective, ran values cam campaigns. Hmm. And Jeb doesn't talk that way. I mean, the, the, the greatest, ex he doesn't cast his immigration policy, it seems to me anyway, in, um, in values terms, yeah. uh, in a way that he, he could. Uh, and you have to be absolutely certain that you are in fact the best person for the job. And George H.W. Bush, for all his modesty, for all his grace, was always certain that he was stronger and tougher and better than whoever else was on the ballot. And I'm just reading it from afar, but I do not, that sense has not yet been conveyed by, by his second son. Yeah. Um, I think the big lesson of, of, of George H.W. Bush's life is that to, to serve, you have to succeed. To succeed in politics means someone else has to lose. And the real test is, what do you do with power once you've amassed it? And again and again in his life, over, over a full 91 years, he may not have always done the admirable thing to win power, but once he had it, he tried to put the country first. Great way to end. Thank you, John, Thanks. very much. And don't forget there's a book signing after, or right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ooh, watch your thing now.